Hello everyone, it's Scott Hebbard here from Spark Systems here with you today. Welcome to our next Sparks Global presentation entitled How to Succeed with Your Modeling Approach. So this webinar series will be posted on the Spark Systems YouTube channel, allowing us to hear from Sparks experts from all around the world, including our guest tonight, Dr. Horst Kargel. Uh, so there's a variety of different topics and if you uh, take a look at either the Spark Systems website or YouTube, you'll see a number of different topics. So in the past few weeks, we've talked about TM Forum, Tools for Enterprise Architecture, Prolaborate, Architecture in the Digital Age, and we've talked about a number of innovative features with EA15 and the Pro Cloud Server. So Sparks Global encompasses Sparks companies all around the world that facilitate services, support, localization, training, mentoring, and much more. And uh, we certainly look at Sparks tooling around our enterprise architect. So if the content today uh, piques your interest, or if you'd like to get in touch with uh, Spark Services Central Europe, uh, please go to sparksystems.com slash partners, sparkservices.html and look up the relevant provider in your region. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Horst Kargel. So Dr. Horst Kargel has been working with object oriented modeling since 2000, before joining Spark Systems Central Europe in 2008. He was a research associate at the Vienna University of Technology, and he worked on projects in the areas of e-learning, semantic web, and model-driven software development. He wrote his dissertation and dealt with the automatic integration of modeling languages. His focus is on software and systems, architecture, code generation, as well as customization and extension possibilities of the modeling platform Enterprise Architect to support a customer modeling approach. He's the author of several titles, uh, regularly gives lectures on model-driven software development, such as one today, and is involved in industry research and projects. So uh, welcome, Horst, and I apologise if I uh, butchered your surname with my uh, Aussie accent. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Well, uh, yeah, my name is Horst Kagel. I'm from Spark Systems Central Europe. And today I'm going to talk about how to succeed with your modeling approach using Enterprise Architect. This is part one of a series I would like to give. It's about the benefit of a model-based specification and how you find a suitable modeling approach. Spark System Central Europe is a sister company of uh, Sparks HQ and we provide uh, licenses and training as Spark Systems. And as a Spark Service Central Europe, we also provide consulting uh, around enterprise architect and your modeling and modeling approaches. We are located in Vienna in Austria and our colleagues in Australia, the headquarter is located next to Melbourne in the southern part of Australia. Good, when it comes to writing specifications, we often use tools like Word, Visio, PowerPoint and Excel. Maybe in combination with uh, graphical modeling languages like UML, SysML, BPMN or others. As well, we use German or English as a, as a, as a language to write the text around the pictures we, we draw maybe in Visio, copy it into Word and write our specifications. Or we can use a modeling tool like Enterprise Architect. Actually, what we compare now is a text-based specification approach to a model-based specification approach. And what does a model-based specification approach provide more than a text-based approach? It is, for instance, the modeling platform Enterprise Architect provides a lot of automations. The graphical modeling language itself is actually a visualization of structured data. And the modeling platform Enterprise Architect provides a lot of automations to process this data. This is already a benefit to go with a, a model-based approach. But now let's have a closer look at uh, the, the topics we have to deal with the text and the model-based approach. First of all, we have to know the tools. We have to master them. As well, we have to learn or have to, to know the language on a certain level. Yeah, of course, uh, I can speak German and I can speak English and maybe uh, uh, if I have to write a, a specification in, in French or, or, or Spanish, I have to learn the language as well as 
I have to learn the language uh, when I use something else as uh, UML, SysML, PPMN, Archimate or, or others. Then we have to think about the structure. On the left-hand side, we have to think about the structures of the text of the document. So we have to think about the chapters, which information is in which chapter. On the right-hand side, we have to think about the structure of the models. Um, then we have to think about the, the information itself, so the details of the information and how abstract the information is in the text-based approach as well as in the model-based approach. And in the end, we have to deal with the problem itself we would like to describe with a text-based specification or with a model-based specification. So in the end, actually, we have to, yeah, there are, um, there are efforts we have to spend uh, going with a text-based or a model-based approach. And you can see that um, going with a model-based approach uh, requires a little more effort than going with a text-based approach. Why? Because, yeah, we know already the tools like Word and Excel, we use them every day. If you don't have experience with a modeling tool, of course, you have to learn the tool. The same with the languages. So uh, I can speak English and German, so that it's not a big deal to to uh, to write a text-based specification, I have just to follow a few rules how to write specific uh, chapters. On the right-hand side, if you're not familiar with uh, the modeling language, it's it's like you learn a complete new language, like learning French or Spanish. Um, yeah, and uh, we have to deal with the same topics in both approaches doesn't matter which one we go. Uh, so in the end, we have the same uh, topics to address. And when we compare now the um, approaches, the effort for uh, going with a modeling tool like Enterprise Architect um, pays off if you use the first automations. The first possibility is what, what brings a benefit. If you would like to use uh, UML or SysML also in your, your text-based approach, of course you have to learn uh, the language as well. So you have to know UML, you have to learn it. So the effort is more or less uh, the same if you, if you would like to go with a text-based approach. And in the end, don't forget the other topics because this, uh, these topics are often forgotten uh, when you go with a model-based approach, this could prevent the success of uh, your modeling approach. So the advantage of, of a model is, remember, a graphical modeling language contains structured data. So actually we are dealing with structured data, which are stored in a model repository. The model repository of Enterprise Architect is a database, by the way, which offers uh, other advantages as well. And we're able now to work in a team environment uh, with this model repository. And the first low-hanging fruit is we can generate the documents, what we previously wrote manually. We have painted pictures with Visio, copied the pictures into uh, the Word document, wrote, wrote the text around it, and that was our specification. With a model-based approach, we can use a single point of information inside of the model repository if we do it right. Yeah? And then we have the templates, the automations, which are template-based to generate one, two, three, five, as many documents we like based on one single source of information, which is our model. So we just have to modify the model and in one location and we can automatically regenerate our five documents and we don't have to read the whole document uh, and, and change all the pages and find all the pictures we have drawn and, and update them um, if we have changed something. So this is the first low-hanging fruit which, which already pays off uh, going with model-based approach. And then we can also uh, generate other kind of, uh, of, of text like source code, XML, a schema or database schema. And we can also reverse engineer them and do a round trip engineering or we can also generate other kind of structured text. So what we are dealing here is, we are dealing with uh, model to text transformations, but Enterprise Architect also provides uh, the possibility for model to model transformations. If we have a model to model transformation, we can um, follow the OMGs, the Object Management Group's uh, MDA approach, Model Driven Architecture approach. 
which states that we can go from a more abstract model to a more specific platform specific model, from a platform independent to a platform specific model and then we can generate the source code, the schema or whatever from the platform specific model. For instance, we can start with a, a logical data model we can automatically transform this logical data model into a physical data model and then we can generate the database schema. Enterprise Architect also provides a lot of standardized interfaces to be integrated in a tool chain. For instance, uh, uh, Spark Systems Enterprise Architect supports XMI in different versions. XMI is the XML metadata interchange format, also a standard or an open service for lifecycle and collaboration, OSLC also a standardized interface and Enterprise Architect provides a powerful API which allows you to integrate any other tool uh, and automatically imports data into the model repository, process the data and then maybe export it to the next tool in the tool chain. Within Enterprise Architect we can use other automations to um, automatically process the data. For instance, we can validate the data when we automatically import data or manually create the models. We can validate the models if they follow uh, specific rules and guidelines to check them on the structural level. We can use simulations for behavior models to also check um, the, the semantic of our models. So we can, for instance, start with a, with a, a set of pre-configured inputs, then we can run the simulation and prove if the model provides the result we expect, so to prove if the semantic of the model is correct. And then we can also use uh, the Enterprise Arctic API internally to add any kind of automations uh, you, you like. For instance, we can react on events. We can add additional user interfaces to help uh, the user to follow a specific model wing approach. Yeah, the important thing here is the rules and guidelines because with rule, without the rules and guidelines, we may be lost because we, we are doing the wrong thing or uh, we creating too much or too less information. So if everything is done right, we can gain benefits from all these automations. So what skills do we need now for our modeling approach? Yeah, you know, a fool with a tool is just a fool. Uh, a genius without a tool is not productive and a genius without a plan is lost. So at least we have four dimensions we have to know. So we have to know the language, at least on a certain level. We have to master the tool and we have to be able to use the language within the tool. And languages like UML or SysML uh, have a lot of possibilities, different, different views, uh, and we can use this language uh, in different ways to express the same information. The same with Enterprise Architect. Enterprise Architect provides a lot of possibilities which can be used in different ways. And in combination, it's op it opens a huge space of possible solutions. And therefore, we need a modeling approach, which never downs this space and makes it clear how to work and how to uh, put this information into our models to be able to answer questions with them. Two questions are important. Who reads the model and what information should be read from the model? If we have these two questions in mind, we are already on the, on the right track, developing our modeling approach. Of course, the more experience we have, the easier it is to develop our modeling approach. You can gain experience by just start modeling, make mistakes and learn from your mistakes or learn from the mistakes of others. So try to get best practices. So starting now with uh, models, you see that there is a learning curve and the learning curve starts flat and then it goes steep and then it goes flat again. And the steep part is the critical part because if you stop learning here or stop developing a modeling approach, uh, you may not be able to uh, get the benefits of the modeling approach which you may can gain. So. So um, 
Horst, perhaps if I could uh, interrupt you there. Yes. Um, yeah. So does this mean that our customers, so enterprise architect users, need to be highly skilled and experienced before they begin a modeling project? Hmm. No, uh, no. But some one has to provide an adequate modeling approach which reduce the complexity. Only this modeling approach must be learned and EA, enterprise architect, can be customized to guide the modeler through the modeling approach, I would say. Thanks. And I can see on the slide there, it says, uh, learn from uh, other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this kind of the area where Spark Systems Central Europe can provide assistance to people that are perhaps new to Enterprise Architect or want to develop a, a better modeling approach? Of course, yeah. We have a lot of experiences in, in the domain of enterprise architecture and uh, also systems engineering. We have supported a lot of uh, uh, companies in, in this area. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, projects with them. So we have we have a lot of experience and we can support you uh, to learn from the mistakes of uh, what we saw already and uh, also the, the s successful projects we, we have also uh, seen. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, yeah, so at least you can see that uh, uh, on this slide we have different uh, skill levels and your whole team should be at least um, on the on the same uh, level, skill level. So at least they should be on the fundamental or between the fundamental and the advanced level. Then you are uh, already uh, successful and uh, you can follow the modeling approach. The modeling approach itself consists now uh, of a method and a process. The method itself con contains uh, the language elements we should use, the connectors we should use, and what connectors should be used between which elements. Uh, so we don't use the whole language, we don't use whole SysML or UML or, or other languages, we use just a subset of it and if we miss something we can we can add additional uh, information additional stereotypes and take values based on again a standard it's the UML profile mechanism which enterprise architect supports to extend existing languages and customize and adopt uh, the tool to your needs in addition to that uh, the modeling approach also contains the model structure which is similar to the chapter structure of our uh, text-based specification and also defines which elements should be contained in which pack packages. Like uh, in the text-based approach we also say in this chapter we, we expect to find this information or we, we would like to find another information. And at least uh, we should define additional rules, constraints and guidelines. Um, the first part defines the language or the subset with maybe possible domain-specific extensions we call in this domain specific language DSLs. And the next one, the next two bullets are about the model structure. And the last one is the governance, which also contains parts of the process, which tells me which artifacts should be created, when, and who's the responsible person for this step. And this is now our project meta model. So when we talk about project meta model, this is contained in the project meta model. And without a project meta model, we may end up with um, a model like this. It's huge. It's maybe not that well structured. Maybe it's, it's hard to answer questions. It, it may be contained a question, but it's hard to answer. And it's maybe even harder to maintain this model. So... so so, Horst, um, yeah. perhaps before you move on, mm -hmm. um, so you can see there's a lot of complexity there. So why is um, customization and providing some of the structure that you talk about important when you're developing your modeling approach? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, you may think uh, a modeling approach may be similar for, for a domain, for, for the same domain, but in details, uh, there will always be uh, different or specific questions which require a flexible tool support and the possibility to customize uh, to support the elaborated modeling approach. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
how to find now the modeling approach? Remember, we have already uh, suggested two questions. Who reads the model and uh, what information should be read from the model? Better formulate concrete questions. Like short example, uh, one question, what signals do we have? Then we think about what language can answer this, uh, uh, what language can be used to answer this question and what element should be used for this. For instance, we can stay with UML and we can use the UML signal, uh, which is also available in SysML, to answer this question. Okay, and then we have a second question. Who, who is receiving a signal? For instance, my signal. Again, we can, we can use uh, UML receptions. So we have a class, my class, which contains a reception, which states that my class is able to receive my signal. If we have a third question, who sends a signal, the signal, my signal? Well, then there is another model. Uh, we, can, we can, for instance, use activity diagrams with a send signal action. So that's a send signal action, and a send signal action is contained in an activity which describes the behavior of a class, of a classifier, your class. Yeah. With this model, with this example, we can now answer these three questions. But if we have experience enough, we can also find an easier solution, which may look like this. Yeah. Instead of using the activity, the send signal and the reception, we, we stay with the classes as the container who sends and who receives, receives the signal. We stay with the signal, but we use an information flow and the signal as an information item. And here we can also um, answer the question, who is sending the signal, your class, who is receiving the signal, and which signals do we send or receive. It's a much easier representation. And what we have done now, what we have created here is a reference model. So we have collected questions. We have tried to find a model solution, a modeling approach, uh, a model representation with the data which allows me to answer my questions. From this reference model, we can derive now the project meta model, which contains our rules and guidelines. With this approach, you will prevent modeling too much or modeling too complex models. And you can assure that uh, any model uh, has a purpose and you have found the easiest representation of it. Of course, if you have more questions, further questions, maybe uh, this solution is, is not enough. Uh, maybe you, you end up with, uh, with a more complex solution, but then again, automations can come into play. You can start with this and automatically generate the more complex model based on the information you have presented here. Or also the other way around. Uh, if you start and add also uh, an, an activity with a send signal action in my class, an information flow can also be created to the receiver of the signal to have these two levels of abstraction, to be able to answer some questions easier uh, if you need the, also the information in the more complex model. Yeah, the more questions you have, the easier it is to find the required language elements because then you know what to answer with your model. Unfortunately, we also saw uh, modeling approaches failing. We have collected just a few uh, of them or the most representative one. The first one is the intuitive approach. So you start modeling right away without specific rules, guidelines, modeling approaches. You do just the best you know and you, you gain benefits, yeah, you, you will gain benefits, but then in sometimes uh, the modeling approach stops, dies, because you have created a model like this, um, which cannot be maintained anymore, it's hard to answer questions, and if the model is not maintained, it, it, uh, it's outdated and uh, yeah, you cannot use it anymore. That's the reason why this approach often stops. If you have... Um, a new employee, and this employee is really experienced in modeling and modeling approaches, and he says, yeah, I have, uh, in my previous company, I have uh, worked uh, uh, as an architect, and this is the way we did it, and that's the modeling approach, and uh, this is how it works. Uh, maybe this also fails, because this approach is maybe too complex, 
And if there is no additional support, for instance, could be just the training to train the people, to train the, uh, the employees, your team, uh, the required language elements or the, the, the features of the tool, or at least the methods, the, the modeling approach, um, it's hard to follow this approach to get all the benefits because this approach may be too complex. But again, uh, Enterprise Architect as a modeling platform allows us to add support with customizations, with automations. We can re reduce the complexity of the user interface. We can add assistance, which guides you through this complex modeling approach, which validates the model so that you, you can be assured that uh, whenever you have stopped working and you, whenever you would like to generate the, the document, you can assure uh, that the content of the model is correct. So another scenario is uh, you try to uh, reach a strategic aim uh, with a lot of benefits. You have a small team, uh, you have uh, eight months time or a year time for reaching this, this aim. And uh, in a certain point in time, the budget is over or a new project comes and uh, you need your employees. So um, there's no time anymore to work on the modeling approach. You stop, you have no result, which already brings a benefit. You have just spent a lot of time and money without the result. What we suggest is to um, go with the low hanging fruit, try to find the questions which, which really need be, uh, which, which must be answered uh, um, and uh, can be easily answered. Try to work with this approach at time, get experience, and then jump to the next level. And again, if there comes the point in time where the budget is over or time is over or the employees are uh, used to somewhere else, you can go back to the uh, approach which already worked and brings already benefit because the team already knows it and know how to work with this. So that's the iterative approach. Um, now I would like to introduce a process, uh, how to elaborate uh, a modeling approach. First of all, you should have um, a small team within an expert workshop. So you need to know the possibilities. So you need to know what the modeling language provides, what uh, the tool provides. And we as a Spark Systems uh, and Service Central Europe, we can teach you the basics. So with this uh, basic knowledge, you can in the next step, collect the required questions for your domain, which allows you uh, to, to get this information from the specification. And of course, we can also consult you uh, and provide example questions for your domain. Yeah. Then you have your required information, what the model should answer. And based on these questions, you start creating a reference model. And of course, we can also support you. We have a lot of experience in different domains <clears throat> and uh, different examples for uh, questions and how to, how to uh, answer these questions with a model-based approach. The result of uh, creating the reference model is, of course, the reference model. And the next step is the most important one. You have to perform a stress test. So now we open the group, we uh, show the reference model, our other team members, and they should try to answer the collected questions. And they should try to maintain the reference model. If they are successful, we are we have won. We are we are happy because we have found our modeling approach. If there is a problem answering questions or maintaining the model, we can add customizations, configurations, and automations. So, and you, we can support you deriving the project meta model from the reference model. So, define the rules and guidelines, do all the meta model configurations. Uh, configurations of enterprise architect and maybe the automations which are required. And that's actually the result of your modeling approach. So these are the, the, the cubes which are report, uh, required for your modeling approach or will contain your modeling approach. And based on the modeling approach we have developed now, we can start and prepare a customized training. So we can also 
prepare this training material for you. Then you have your customized training <clears throat> for your modeling approach. And then we can also perform the training. And in the end, you have your uh, skilled and happy employees. And instead of learning all the possibilities the language provides and all the possibilities Enterprise IDEC provides, you just have to learn what is required for your modeling approach. And the tool is already customized to 100% support your modeling approach and makes it easy also for part-time modelers because we have the experience that many uh, of the modelers use Enterprise Architect just a few times a year for a period of a few weeks or one, two months when a project is started or in the end, uh, or just once a week or once a month. So following a really complicated modeling approach, a project meta model, is not that easy without the customizations and configurations and, and additional automations. So we are nearly finished. I will summarize now. With Enterprise Architect, we have a really powerful platform with many possibilities and a lot of freedom. We also have the freedom to configure and customize Enterprise Architect and add additional rules, constraints, and guidelines. For instance, when, we, when it comes to configuration, we can reduce the complexity of the user interface. Um, or we can get uh, custom templates. So we can customize the templates which are used to uh, generate the documents, generate code, generate XML schemas, and so on. Uh, we can also add custom searches. Remember, Enterprise Architect uh, repository is a database, so it's easy to, to write uh, searches, which allows us already to answer questions easily, and many more. It's just configuration. And then we have the project meta model, which contains uh, the constraint meta model, which allows us to uh, define custom toolboxes, quick linkers, again, which makes the user interface easier to work with and follow the modeling approach, uh, which also contains additional rules and constraints, which can be automatically uh, applied to the model and we get the verification, validation of the model. Then we can add additional rules and guidelines for the nesting of the model elements, the model structure, and many more things can also be contained in a project meta model. And the automations provides us now possibility to assist um, the modeler to answer uh, complex questions. An easy way to answer complex questions, as I mentioned, is already the, the custom search. But sometimes um, it's not easy to, to uh, do a custom search. It's, it's easier to uh, add an uh, other automation, a script or whatever, uh, which, which answers the questions. And we can also add additional user interfaces or automations, which helps me to create uh, a more complex model uh, and to follow the project meta model. Yeah, and with additional rules and guidelines, um, we can also use these automations to follow the project meta model. Yeah. And uh, in one of my next talks, I would like to go into more details about uh, the possibility of configurations, the possibility of the project meta models and uh, possible automations. But for now, Remember, if I could just add one thing too with uh, Enterprise Architect 15 with configurations, uh, yeah. based on your login uh, credentials, it can automatically uh, tailor the user interface based on your login as well. So, um, there's new uh, profile sets up uh, there as well to uh, uh, enhance that configuration as well. So. Good point, Scott. Yeah, this is this is one of, of the, the, the great configura possible configurations of Enterprise Architect. So it's it's also a low-hanging fruit. Um, if you have an idea what you need, you can simply configure Enterprise Architect and reduce already, already a lot of the complexity and makes it easier for your modeler to succeed with the modeling approach. Yeah. Um, for now, just remember, who reads the model and what information should be read. Then derive the um, uh, project meta model and your modeling approach in Enterprise Architect. 
If you have questions, we have now time for further questions, or you can write me an email to horsecargo at Spark Systems EU or to vendor at Spark Systems EU. We have also the English speaking web, uh, web page or a German speaking, uh, speaking website, and also English and German speaking blog. Thanks, okay. Horst. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times low hanging fruit. So mm -hmm. with your experience with various customers, what are some of the really simple things that you can do that can result in saving time, increasing productivity, or creating some really big wins for customers that they can, uh, you know, get really quickly. And I know we've talked about UI customization, but uh, yeah. are there a few other um, very common low hanging fruit that uh, you notice from time to time? Yeah, the, the low hanging fruits are, of course, uh, compared to to the text based approach where you where you paint your your models in, in in Word, PowerPoint, or so. You have this model repository. You have a single point of information, and you can create different views. So you have one element in the project browser. And you have you have used it in five diagrams, and you can configure the diagram already to show more or less details, to hide information. And whenever you change this information in one diagram, um, the other diagrams are automatically updated and changed. So your your model is always consistent. Yeah, this is one of the the low hanging fruit. Uh, and uh, the second one is, for instance, the the, the, the document generation, uh, which which automatically generates you. Uh, for you the, the document, what is previously handwritten, uh, especially when it comes to maintenance. Maybe the, um, the start, introducing the modeling approach takes a little more effort, but when it comes to maintenance, it pays off because then it becomes easier. If you have to read 50 or 100 pages, uh, whenever you update something, you have to read the whole document over and over again to find all the all the places where you have this information and you have to change it. In the model repository, you have just one single point of information and you change it and then regenerate the documents and you have all your 300 page documents consistent and complete again with one click. Yes, and I know I've shown many customers where We'll make a few changes to the model and I hit F8 and I generate out a documentation. I say, there you go, you can pay a consultant $10,000 to produce a report or you can just hit F8 in EA and do it instantly. Right. In two minutes. <laughs> um, so yes, I have uh, experienced that myself. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a question from Dean that says, uh, is it fair to say that the modeling approach is also about what not to include in the model? In other words, uh, should it have a specific and deliberate purpose? And you talked of course, about yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes to open or closed world assumptions. So uh, open world assumption says, okay, um, you, you have to do what it's in the model approach. Everything else is open. You can, you can add whatever you like, or you can also go with a closed world approach and say, no, only uh, what it's in the modeling approach, what's in my project meta model is allowed, nothing else. Yeah, and it, it's good to also add uh, the information within this view or within this package. You find this information, but you will not find that information. Makes it easier for the for the modeler or for the reader of the model uh, to to prevent searching over and over uh, and do not find this information or say that okay, there is something missing. Uh, because the few will not provide it. And if we have this information also in our modeling approach, then it's easier uh, to understand uh, how to read the model. Yes. Uh, there's a question from Michael that says, you know, is there a export tool to export parts of the EA model out to something uh, like Visio? Now, of course, I'd argue that you don't need Visio at all and it's a, yeah. a static tool. Uh, however, uh, would you be able to talk about um, you know, interoperability between, you know, different products and XMI mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. export mm -hmm. and exporting mm -hmm. diagrams. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, regarding these questions, uh, there is no need to export enterprise architect models to Visio again. There is a much easier way. Um, you can just select the diagram with Control A, select all diagram elements, press Control C, and then paste it into into your Word document or uh, any other Office document and you have your picture if you just need the pictures. Or you can again uh, generate just the diagrams 
you, you can run the, the diagrams only report of Enterprise Architect to get a document which contains all the, all the diagrams and then you can uh, use word features to reference the other word document and the, and the picture uh, within this word document and then you have also a kind of tool chain which automatically updates uh, your pictures in the word document if you would like to go with more text-based approach in addition to to a model-based approach without generating the whole specification out of Enterprise Architect. Yes, thank you. Uh, roughly you had a question saying how uh, this approach can be applied in an agile context. So perhaps agile, that's, that. that's a good good point. Um, more or less, uh, if you if you follow or if you or let me say. Um, for an agile modeling approach, it is required to have a modeling approach, uh, to have rules and guidelines, to restrict the possibilities, what the tool and the, 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 the language provides, because then it makes it easier to, to be agile. And you have to have a tool which allows you to automate something, to be able to react on, on changes, because if you if you change something, because what, what, what does uh, HL means for software development? We have uh, a continuous integration. We have the build server. We have the version control system. Whenever I check in something, the build server builds a new um, new version of my software. We can do the same with, uh, with uh, models, but we, we need to have rules so that the automations may work and doing their job, for instance, generate the, 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 the code out of Enterprise Architect or generate the documents out of Enterprise Architect. Uh, without the, the proper tool support and without the rules and guidelines, we cannot be agile. Because remember this, this picture with this mess model, um, in the beginning, we, we think we are agile, we, we are allowed to do everything, we can model whatever we like, we can use any language um, and we can connect everything. Uh, in the beginning, we are agile, but then we end up really uh, in, in stuck model uh, because we are not able to maintain it anymore. Uh, to be agile, we need a modeling approach with a lot of rules and guidelines, and we need the tool support, which allows us to react quickly on changes. Hmm. Very good. Well, there's uh, a few questions coming in, so I'll try and uh, just pick uh, another couple more and we might uh, wrap things up. Um, so uh, there's a question from Elliot saying, how do you deal with recording changes in the model? Recording changes in the model, like um, does it mean um, who has changed what and uh, why or yes. something? Yeah, I think yeah. it's about you know auditing and um, yeah. You know, so there things. are there are a few few possibilities in enterprise architect. You can use the baseline for a state based. Uh, uh, version and comparing, but you can also use the audit feature, which provides you uh, the information who has uh, changed what, when, and from to. So there are uh, a lot of features out of the box uh, which can be used for that. Um, yes. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's fine. Uh, Michael uh, mentioned R code generator supported, so you can write your code in Enterprise Architect, and it says is there C, so there's support for C, C sharp, C plus plus, and uh, many other languages, and you can also write your own custom support if you like for your own custom language. So mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, something we certainly support. Uh, and there's a couple of examples saying, you know, what's the best practice to have, you know, multiple models in one repository, um, or should you have different repositories set up? Did you have uh, any opinions on that, of course? Uh, yeah, so it, it depends. So if you have different projects which have nothing in common, you should separate them in different enterprise architect repositories. So don't save databases if, if you go with database management systems, um, because um, you you could end up with with uh, with using the wrong elements from the wrong project. If you have uh, overlapping parts, like uh, you have a library which should be used in another project, there are different possibilities to share uh, this this kind of models. Uh, the standard way of doing this is, is always XMI or now OSLC, 
Uh, we have the reusable asset service in Enterprise Architect, which allows us to publish uh, models, libraries, parts of the model, which can be reused. Uh, I would suggest to go this way. Thank you very much. So I might just uh, I'll wrap up myself now. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Horst, for uh, uh, presenting. And uh, I think uh, we look forward to seeing uh, some of the, uh, the follow-up topics. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, we'll have more Enterprise Architect 15 webinars coming up. Um, we have a, another webinar that we're going to talk about ProLaborate. And there are a number of questions on the ProCloud server and WebEA. And of course, a lot of these tools allow you to take the models and uh, share them via the web or via mobile devices and uh, gives you a great deal of flexibility. Uh, so we're going to talk about that next week. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Nizam do a presentation uh, actually in two weeks time where we look at ProLaborate in a bit more detail. Uh, as I mentioned in the uh, audio uh, tests at the beginning, I've got a couple of events coming up. One, the Gartner IT Symposium in Australia on the Gold Coast, and the other is Building Business Capability in Florida. And there is also IRM UK, which is on right now, that Spark staff are attending, and I'll be attending Gartner and BBC. So please uh, feel free to drop by the Sparks booth if you're there and say hello. As always, if you have any suggestions, please just send them through to webinar at sparksystems.com and uh, we'd be happy to get them to you. Uh, there were quite a few questions, um, so I might uh, compile them and send them through to Horst and we might be able to uh, write some uh, written uh, uh, details to some of those questions and get them listed on sparksystems.com. So uh, finally, thank you very much Horst for your uh, time tonight. It was great to um, get that uh, summary and I'm sure there are many people that would like uh, some follow-ups, including maybe um, you know, showing some things in EA to show how you can do some of the easy customizations. So uh, that's great. Thank you. No problems. And uh, I appreciate everyone joining us tonight. It was great to see so many people online. Uh, someone said I'm in the USA and it was a bit early. Uh, the last few have been for a US audience. This is probably a bit better for a European audience. Uh, but as always, this will be made available on uh, YouTube, uh, Spark Systems YouTube site, so it can be reviewed at a later date. So that's it from us. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day, evening or night, depending where you are in the world. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ciao.